Well, hello, folks. This is your Watchman on the Wall. And, of course, we're approaching Christmas time, a time where we've got just about as much controversy in America as when in Israel the Messiah first came on the first Christmas. But I want to talk about a section in the count of the Christmas story in Matthew, familiar to most of us. Simple, straightforward account of how the Lord Jesus Christ was born and uh, the circumstances around that. But in this simple, straightforward account, there are tremendous questions that are raised. I, I mean, profound questions that have very important answers. And that's what I want to talk about right now, the irony of Christmas. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 2, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem was troubled. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him immediately, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, by no means are the least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Now that's from Micah chapter 5 verse 2 that these theological experts of Israel quoted. Then Herod secretly called the Magi from the east and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them. Apparently it reappeared, and it went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way beautiful, simple account of the birth of Jesus. And, uh, you know, I, I learned this as a child, and I'm sure not as many learn it as a child as in my day, but uh, still most of us have heard that Christmas story. And yet how many of us, and I think very few, really ponder this account and see the tremendous, profound questions that are raised by this account. So let me just draw out some of the important questions that arise out of this simple account. First of all, who were the Magi? The Magi are, are uh, defined in Daniel chapter 2, verse 2. You know, the, uh, the uh, people of Judea were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonian Empire back in 586 B.C. Finally, they destroyed all of Israel. 603, they began the destruction. And they carried away, especially those of the royal house. And they brought them to Babylon. And uh, Daniel, one of the brightest of the young, young boys that were taken about, he was uh, a very young teenager, and he and two of his friends were found to exceed in wisdom and intelligence, all the others. So 
King Nebuchadnezzar commanded that they be put into the uh, special advisory committee, which was a group of magi, or uh, as it says in uh, Daniel chapter 2, they were, uh, they were composed of magi, of uh, astrologers, and they also were called the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans were a special caste of priests that really kind of described all of them that could trace their lineage all the way back to the Tower of Babel. And they were a very, very well-educated and studious group that understood books of magic, and they were master astronomers, and they applied this astronomy to a religious orientation called astrology. And uh, this is a special priest caste that dated all the way back to the Tower of Babel. They were extraordinary people, and the kings of Babylon used them as their special advisors. Here are these magi, these special caste of priests, or master astronomers, that come all the way from the east, a very dangerous journey. And they come with uh, a, a, a small ransom for a king in treasures that they bring along with them. And they come all the way on that dangerous journey from Babylon to Judea and Jerusalem. Now, what in the world would motivate these men who are Gentiles and of this special priest caste to come all the way over there to worship a Jew, a baby Jew that's born king of the Jews. How would they know that? How would they know, first of all, that uh, he was born? And secondly, how would they know about him being born as the king of the Jews? And uh, what would cause them to be motivated to come on that very perilous journey to come and worship the king of the Jews? Those are profound questions. So you see that underneath, undergirding all of this simple story are profound questions. How do they know about this? Well, we go back in the book of Daniel and we find that uh, the... Uh, there were many things that happened during Daniel's time there where the wise men, as they were generally called, all of the Chaldean priests, were called upon to make emergency uh, interpretations of dreams that the king had. And because they couldn't answer them, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, tell him what his dream was and then interpret it, he ordered them all put to death. And that's when Daniel, as a very young teenager, stepped forward and he says, your servant will tell you, O king, what it means. And because he was able to do this in several different incidences, he saved the lives of all of these wise men, all of this priest cast. Now, he was with these people for at least 70 years from from the childhood all the way up in these older years, and he remained a member of this priest caste. And uh, in the process of time, many of those, seeing the miracles that were worked through Daniel, the supernatural wisdom that he had, they came to believe in the God of Israel. And uh, apparently, God wanted to accommodate himself to their area of expertise and give them a sign that would indicate when the Messiah, the King of the Jews, would be born. And so knowing that they were master astronomers, he apparently gave them a special star that would appear and they were to look for. And when they saw this, they would know that the Messiah, the King of the Jews, had been born. And this had been passed down from one generation to one generation for several hundred years until this took place. Now, not only did Daniel give them this sign from God, 
But Daniel in chapter 9 had also given a prophecy that's in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, that would indicate the general time the Messiah had to be born because he predicted the exact day that he would be rejected. It would be exactly 483 biblical years from the time a king would release the the Israelites to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and the city. And that happened in the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 describes it. So they knew all of these things. They knew that Artaxerxes Lagimanus of Persia, who conquered Babylon, was the one that officially gave them the right to both build the temple and the city. And it was exactly 483 years from that that the Messiah was to come, be rejected, and be put to death. All of this is in the prophecy. So they knew these general times, and they saw the star. Why is it that when they go to the king and ask him, where is the one who is born king of the Jews, for we have come to worship him? (laughs) It's interesting that instead of them rejoicing that the Messiah they'd all look for, or supposedly were supposed to be looking for, in the prophecies of the Old Testament and the scriptures of the Israelites, that when they came and said this, that they were all troubled. Why were they troubled? They should have rejoiced. But they didn't. And, of course, Herod was a phony Israelite. He was a half-breed. And he, all he thought about was, here's someone who's going to take away my throne. So, you see, there was a real uh, politically incorrect thing to do in that time. And that was to say there's somebody who has been born king of the Jews. And uh, he's, incidentally, he's going to take away your throne, Herod. So, that's just part of what happened on that on that period of history that we celebrate at Christmas time. When Herod asked the Jewish theologians, the experts, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? They knew immediately. They were able to quote from memory, Micah chapter 5, verse verse 2, which said, but you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, though you be little among the many, was quoting literally now from the Hebrew. Though you be little, too little to be numbered among the many of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth one to me, whose days are from everlasting, who shall be ruler over my children Israel. Now, uh, they knew how to quote that. They knew where he was supposed to be. But they weren't looking for him. They knew the prophecies but they apparently hadn't really pondered them. And so even though they could quote them, they obviously didn't believe them. So when the uh, master astronomers, the Magi, when they asked Herod about this and, uh, and the chief priest told him about this prophecy, he said, you go and you, wor- you worship him. And you come back and report to me that I might worship him too. Of course, that was clever. He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to kill him. But the interesting thing to me, these Gentiles raced off to Bethlehem to find this one born king of the Jews. And the Pharisees and the Jewish chief priests They didn't even bother to go along out of curiosity to see what this was all about. They didn't even go to see. So then the Magi, uh, as they started off, the star that they had seen in the east, the one that the Lord had given them as a sign that was handed down among their caste from one generation to another, it suddenly reappeared. And they followed, it's a miracle, of course, they followed this, mag, uh, uh, this miraculous star that moved and stood right over the house where Jesus 
was staying. Now I want you to realize something else here too. Where was Jesus born? There was no room at the inn when they came to Bethlehem. And uh, they had to, had to stay in a manger where animals were fed. And uh, that's where Jesus was born. And he was placed in a feeding stall as his crib. But when the uh, Magi come from Babylon over to worship him, when they find him, he's no longer in, a, in, in the uh, animal stall in the crib. They're in a rented house. So it shows this was some time after he had been born. They saw the star, and it would have taken them some time to come over. And by the way, we're told that these three wise men come from the east and so forth. They couldn't have come alone. They were carrying enormous wealth. And they were men of wealth. That was obvious. So for these three, three men to come to see Jesus, they had to come with a caravan, an armed caravan. They came. So there was a big retinue of people that were with them. It wasn't just three men that came from the east. And so here they come and they, they find the place where he is. And it would have had to have been some time after he had been born. And that answers the question, after, uh, after the wise men came and they worshipped him and they left, they secretly went out another way. Herod was furious and he came there. And he had all the male children born in Bethlehem killed. You see, he wanted to make sure he got them, but it would have been sometime, maybe a year, he was maybe a year old by that time. And he had, just to make sure he got them all, he had everyone two years and older put to death. Horrible. But I want you to see what an amazing thing this is. It shows that the Israelites who had received and wrote down the scripture had come to a place where they no longer were really reading and studying their scripture for themselves. They were just studying man-made interpretations of these things. And they really weren't paying attention to prophecy because they had no idea the Messiah might be born at that time. And yet here are Gentiles who because they believed in the message that had been given them by Daniel that there was a Savior coming for mankind through the Israelites, the Jews, and that he would come and be born the King of Israel. That they believed it. They came and uh, they worshipped him. And they didn't care how politically incorrect it was to say, we have come to worship the King, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. They didn't care who it troubled, and even though it, it troubled all of Judea and all of Jerusalem. They just didn't care. And it's kind of like today, you know, for most of the lifetime of America, we have always celebrated the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I won't get into the argument of the exact date he was born. That's not important because Christmas has been set aside on December 25th as a time to celebrate the birth of the Son of God who came to die in our place, who came to take upon himself the sin of all mankind and to pay for it and to purchase a pardon for each one of us. That's why it's customary at Christmas time to give gifts, because God gave his greatest gift in the person of his own son, Jesus Christ, who came to die for our sins. And uh, it troubled all of Jerusalem when he was born. And today, more and more, it's troubling all of America to be celebrating his birth. Have you ever seen a time in the history of America? I mean, I'm now 80 years old, and I can look back over my life, and I can remember Christmas time was something that even those that weren't particularly Christian would celebrate. 
But today, even, even uh, stores where we buy presents no longer want to call it Christmas. And you're not greeted anymore by Merry Christmas. You're greeted by Happy Holidays. And it's like America has become ashamed of the only one that has kept us safe and made us prosper and made us become the great country that we've become. And now we're beginning. As we reject him, this country's falling apart. And the curse has been put upon us with trillions and trillions of dollars in debt he brought with him. We're under a curse from God. And it's time that we turn back to believe and worship him. I believe that uh, Christmas is a time when we need to remember that the one who loved us enough to die for our sins, take upon all of our, all of what we do and fall short of the standards of God and God's law, he paid for it and purchased a pardon that gives us a complete forgiveness for all our sins and brings us into an eternal relationship with God and his family. And that's why as I look at Christmas time, you know, I'm I'm not ashamed to say what it is. And I want you to start proclaiming it. No more of this happy holidays. Let's say what it is. Merry Christmas. And if I knew all the languages in the world, I would say it. And uh, just to, just to tark off ACLU, which is always trying to put down every freedom that we have, especially if it has anything to do with Christianity. So in your face, ACLU and all the rest of you godless people, I say, Meli Kaliki Maka. That's a Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. And I say, Feliz Navidad. That's what it is in Spanish. And I say, Christmas Alegre, which is Portuguese. I say, Natale Alegro, which is Italian. I say, Cala Christogena, which is Greek. I say, Frahe Vachnachten, which is German. My only regret is I don't know more languages in which to say this. But to you I say, let's rejoice. Let's go with those who came from Babylon in a perilous journey to worship him who is the Savior that brings us into eternity in a relationship with God. Don't be ashamed of him. And one more lesson before I quit. You know, immediately after the, the uh, wise men, the magi from the east came, Herod set about to put to death all of the young boys in Bethlehem. And so God warned Joseph in a dream to take Mary, his mother, and Jesus to Egypt. But he was a very poor man. So how could he do it? How could he take him there for safety? God always provides before we know we have a need. You see, those wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We know the value of gold. But myrrh and frankincense were the most expensive fragrances in the ancient world. It would have been worth a small fortune. And so that's what God provided for, for Joseph to take his family to Egypt until Herod the Great died and they would be safe to come back. I hope you learned some lessons about Christmas in this. God bless you. And meditate upon the account of the birth of Christ in each one of the Gospels. It will be a blessing to you.